it's a it's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, um, Professor Alison Marsden. Uh, she's a professor at a, at a, she's a professor and a World Center scholar in the Department of, of Pediatrics and Bioengineering. Uh, before that, she was a faculty member at the University of California, San Diego, um, and uh, before that, uh, she was a PhD here at Stanford. Um, she, she has received numerous awards for her research, for teaching and mentorship. She's a fantastic uh, uh, faculty member and a, a very uh, in, impressive, with a very impressive resume and, and uh, research activities. I also want to say that Alison leads our uh, diversity, equity and inclusion initiative in ICME, which is a newly established group that uh, I'm, I'm sure is going to have a great impact on both community and well-being in ICME. Without further ado, Alison, take it away. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Gianluca. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate our first session, which is on human-centered computational math. And before we jump into the talks, um, I just wanted to highlight that ICME has a growing interest in data science, modeling, and simulation, um, and applied math methods related to healthcare and biomedical application. And this includes a wide range of activities um, which span a number of applications from uh, infectious disease to genomics and bioinformatics, um, protein folding and molecular dynamics, uncertainty quantification and Bayesian models, uh, cardiovascular disease and biomechanics, um, precision and personalized medicine in a variety of applications, um, including cancer. Um, and we are also actively exploring new partnerships with industry partners in the healthcare space, and um, Karen Mathis and I have been actively meeting with some of our partners uh, in that area. Um, as John Luca mentioned, in the fall of 2020 and the winter of 2021, we were pleased to host the Analytics Accelerator, which was sponsored by Accenture, um, in which students worked on group projects related to COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> this was a really uh, active group and, uh, and was you know, a way of engaging ICME further into the healthcare space and forming some new collaborations with the School of Medicine at Stanford. Um, Stanford is a unique place in that you know, it's, it's one of the few places that has a top tier engineering school uh, right next to, right adjacent to a top tier medical school you know, with a, within a stone's throw. And so we're really trying to take advantage of that. Uh, proximity, especially post-COVID. Um, I also wanted to mention that we are starting to plan for new activities to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion among our students and faculty um, and the ICME community broadly. And so we've formed a committee to address these needs, and we're eager to partner with our industry affiliates uh, as part of these efforts. And um, I personally would love to hear your input on this. Um, some ideas that we have immediately are to launch uh, research experiences for undergraduates and also to increase our pipelines for underrepresented minority students um, by partnering with uh, HBCUs. So in today's session, I'm happy to welcome a panel of three faculty, or three members who will speak about different aspects of our activities in the healthcare space. Um, we have Ellen Kuhl, who's going to talk about data-driven modeling in healthcare. Alex Ioannidis, who's going to talk about genomic data science from ancient Polynesian voyages to COVID at Stanford Hospital. And Eric Schockve, who's going to talk about computational design of a microfluidic measurement of the human red blood cell shear modulus distribution. So our first speaker, um, let me introduce Ellen Kuhl. Uh, we were very excited to have Ellen recently join um, our ICME affiliate, although of course we all know Ellen very well <laughs> and have been collaborating for many years. Um, Ellen is the Walter Reinhold Professor in the School of Engineering and the Robert Bosch Chair of Mechanical Engineering here at Stanford. She also holds a courtesy appointment in bioengineering. She received her PhD from the University of Stuttgart in the year 2000. Um, and her area expertise of expertise is broadly in living matter physics, um, uh, continuum mechanics applied to biological applications, um, including the, the brain and heart. 
Um, she's published more than 200 peer-reviewed journal articles, and she's a founding member of the Living Heart Project. Um, she has won a number of awards. I won't list them all, um, but just a few. She's a fellow of the ASME and also of AIMB. Um, she received a NSF Career Award in 2010, a Humboldt Research Award in 2016, and the ASME uh, Ted Belishko Applied Mechanics Award in 2021. And just as an aside, she's also, uh, as if that wasn't enough, she's an all-American triathlete, a marathon runner, and an Ironman World Championship finisher. Um, so Ellen, uh, we're excited to hear your talk. Please go ahead. Thank you, Alison, and thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. This is my first real interaction with ICME, so thank you. Um, I would like to share some of our um, most recent work on the heart. So we also use uh, data-driven modeling a lot for the brain and we've used it for COVID, but I decided to um, share some of the results that we've gotten for the heart and show you some opportunities where we can use um, data-driven modeling and machine learning to better understand the heart. So the specific example that I'm gonna share is uh, drug development. So you probably know that all drugs you're taking have to undergo a serious screening before they can reach the market. And one very um, custom thing is that every drug has to be tested for its side effects on the heart. And you can see a healthy electrocardiogram up on the very top. And there's this little line that's marked as QT. And that's the marker for uh, drug safety. So it's called the QT interval. It's the length between the spike and this little bump in the EKG. And the longer the QT interval, the larger the risk to develop what is shown on the bottom. This is called torsade de prone. This is a condition that is a fibrillation of the heart that's induced by drugs. So we tried to actually develop mathematical tools um, and computation methods to do the screening or pre-screening before even drug development in animals or people can start. So what we use is the living heart. It's a high resolution model of the human heart. And you can see here, it has um, a, uh, about 8 million nodes. So it's a finite element model with regular hexadral elements. And the elements have a side length of 0 0.3 millimeters. And because we model every single cell in the heart with its 15 to 16 ion channels, there's a quarter billion internal variables that we store and update at every time point. Um, we need a very fine temporal resolution. So we have a time step size of 0 0.005 milliseconds. So to simulate five beats, we need a million steps. So you can imagine that that's quite costly. Um, five beats look like what you see here on the top. So this is five beat electrocardiogram of a baseline beating heart, and this is healthy. And now what we do from top to bottom is we co-administer a drug and the drug is called to fetalite. And you can see the higher the concentration of the drug, the longer this path, this distance between the spike and the little bump, the QT interval. And you can see once it reaches a certain length, the heart goes into what's called fibrillation. So there's no regular contraction anymore, but the heart starts to flicker. And at the very bottom, the heart is freezing. So it's not even relaxing completely anymore. This was a study that we've done jointly with Pfizer because this is a drug that's been taken from the market and Pfizer is obviously interested to reinsert it into the market. So there's a lot of opportunities here for machine learning. So I've shown you how expensive this is and you can probably appreciate that we want to make this somehow more efficient. So what we've done is we created a surrogate model. So rather than simulating this all the time, as we do an upfront simulation of 45 um, simulations of this heart with different channel blocks. So we block different ion channels, look um, for the effect of this, and then actually we extract the electrocardiogram. At the same time, we do low fidelity simulations with just a cable that's a one dimensional model. And this is very cheap. So we can just do 400 of them. We put all of this together and create a surrogate model. And from that surrogate model, using multi-fidelity Gaussian process regression, we can do a sensitivity analysis, uncertainty quantification, all nice things without ever having to do the full simulation again. So this is an example of sensitivity analysis. So you can see the cell model here in the bottom uh, right of the figure, and it has uh, different ion channels. So these ion channels are actually responsible for the charge of the cell. And you can see we sorted them by the effect on the QT interval. So the first three reduce the QT interval, and then the other four bring it up. And so you can think of this, um, this result, and we have the seven channels, that the first one is actually safe because it's reducing the length, and the very red one is the most dangerous one because it's increasing the QT interval the most. Another way of picturing it is uh, this kind of sensitivity diagram, where you can see that really the blue channel is um, safe and the red is the risky one. 
And now we thought, what can we do with this information? So we created a two-dimensional screening space where we compare these two channels and leave out everything in the middle because it doesn't affect the QT interval all that much. And just based on these two channels, we want to um, evaluate if any drug that we can test is safe. So here's the, this two-dimensional space. On the horizontal axis, you see the nice or the good drug or a channel. And on the vertical axis, you see the bad channel. And so you can see any point in this diagram either induces fibrillation in the red region, so the heart starts to flicker, or is a regular heartbeat in blue. And you can see how that looks like in the simulation on the left. And what we do is we randomly um, see 10 points, and then we do an active learning. So this is really machine learning as we go to identify this white line, which is the classification boundary between fibrillation and no fibrillation. So the clear classification problem between safe and non-safe drugs. Once we've done this 10 times, we adaptively sample another 30 points. So we only do 40 simulations altogether. And you can see it's a pretty sharp boundary and the points cluster around this classification boundary. So now we can predict all the things we want, but I want to show you that actually this is something that is uh, true in reality. So we teamed up with the medical school, with you and Ashley and Kenya Seo. And what they did for us is they did an experiment where they did exactly find points that lie in the red on the boundary and in the blue regions. So they started the, uh, the experiment with four different concentrations of drugs. The first is baseline. The second is only giving the bad drug. And then on the vertical axis, we co-administer the good drug, and the good drug is called nofedipine. So what you can see in the bottom is the result of giving these drugs to single cells. And you can see there's only fibrillation at number two. And what you see on the bottom right is giving this heart, this drugs to a real excised heart. So this heart is Langendorf perfused in um, a solution, and we um, administer these drugs, and you can see in the heart whether it's fibrillating. So this was reassuring, and here's a kind of a zoom into these results. On the left, you see the uh, simulation. On the right, you see the experiment. And you can clearly see that what we had predicted with our classifier actually comes true. So you do see this fibrillation. And in, upon co-administration of a safer drug, you bring this heart back to a regular rhythm. So now how can we use this? We can use this two-dimensional diagram that I've shown and have a black region that actually is the risk reason, the arrhythmic reason. And we can plot out, in this case, 23 drugs. Every drug is a trajectory because it has a different blockage of these two channels, a trajectory in this two-dimensional space. And once this uh, drug trajectory hits the black, um, the black domain, we uh, calculate the concentration of the drug. And you can see now seven different numbers here with an X, starting with 0.X, 1X, to infinity. And that means that the first drug on this chart hits the um, black line at a 0.1 concentration, which is really, really low. And the last drug, Verapamil, hits this, um, this uh, critical domain never. So this is a safe drug. So we compared this against the uh, safety evaluation in the literature. And these are the numbers from one to five. And you can see that our method correctly predicts all high-risk drugs from one to three, just based on this chart, uh, and all safe drugs from four to five in blue. Um, so this brings me to the end of my presentation. I have tried to show you how we can use machine learning in healthcare. I've shown this for the specific example of drug development, and I've used uh, Gaussian process regression, uncertainty quantification, sensitivity analysis, and classification to characterize the effects of polypharmacy. So that's giving different drugs to the heart at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for that fascinating talk. We're going to move uh, right to the next speaker. Please um, save your questions for the panel discussion at the end of the session. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Alex Ioannidis. Uh, Alex graduated uh, summa cum laude from Harvard University in chemistry and physics, and then earned an MPhil in computational biology and a diploma in Greek from the University of Cambridge. Um, he, his PhD was from Stanford in computational mathematical engineering, um, and he still uh, teaches in ICME uh, machine learning and data science as an adjunct lecturer. Um, he also has a, a master's in MS&E &E, uh, from Stanford and is now a, a research fellow in the Stanford School of Medicine Department of Bi Biomedical Data Sciences, and his work focuses on applying computational methods to problems in genomics and population genetics. Alex, please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Allison. Um, so I'm I'm going to start here. Can 
can everyone see uh, these slides working? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm going to start uh, very quickly just uh, presenting um, what, what the data looks like in this field for those who are not familiar. So what we're dealing with here is DNA data. So we have a picture of actual chromosomes on the left. Um, and then we have a, a, a sort of schematic of what a chromosome really is if you zoom in in the middle and you see it's, it's basically a, a single thread here of uh, DNA that's just all coiled up. And, and that's what you're seeing here. And then another one here that's crossed over on it. And the DNA you know, molecule looks like this. And for our purposes as data scientists and computational mathematicians, we just need to know that DNA is a, a sequence of letters. And there's only four letters. And in fact, it's even simpler than that. At each position, sorry about this. Um, at each position, you have a, a, a letter that, that basically is the same in, in almost everybody if you're from the same species, because you, you can't vary these letters too much. If you change the code too much, you, you, you end up breaking the, the organism. Occasionally you can have a mutation that's still viable and that's what makes us different from one another. And we can indicate those mutations as uh, just a one. Uh, so we have a zero if you have this sort of standard, we call it reference, and a one if you have a, a different uh, variant there. And so with that, we just have a vector of zeros and ones. Um, and with that, we can start doing data science. Now, populations around the world historically have, have spread out over tens of thousands of years. We all originally came from Africa. Uh, spread in, you know, over the, the next uh, 10,000 years across Asia and Europe, mixing with ancient hominids who've already lived there, like Neanderthals, and eventually into the Americas across the Bering Strait. These spreads were founder events, um, and I'm just getting to that here. Founder events cause genetic drift, and that's described by you know, equations that, that we like to use in, in ICME. Um, but the, the important thing is that each of these founder groups crossing the Bering Strait, entering Europe, they, they experienced a genetic drift, a sort of change in the frequencies of all the mutations that they have due to the, the founders uh, who, who, who got there and what their composition was. And over the next thousands of years, these uh, ran walk through basically frequency space continued. And so we have different populations today having different uh, frequencies of different variants and, and having different characteristics genetically. And this is sort of an illustration of that random walk in frequency space here. We look at three dimensions. So looking only at three positions on the DNA strand and the frequency of the different mutations there and you can move uh, you know, randomly uh, in this three dimensional space with time, basically each population moving independently away from each other. And this is described usually in biology by the tree you see on the right where you, you see splits and the branch lengths are, are proportional to how long it's been since the populations uh, split and how much genetic drift they've undergone. So we can analyze these differences in, in population sequences along the DNA strand, these, this genetic drift that's accumulated by looking at uh, the actual sequences, as I said, letters, translating it to the numbers of zero ones. And then we can do all sorts of machine learning on those numbers. We can look at windows of them and we can classify them. And I just wanna call out two ICME students here who did a lot of this work with me, Arvin Kumar and Helgi Hilmerson, who actually have a poster that you can see uh, after this event uh, presenting their work on this. But basically we can label every section of the genome and which ancestry it came from. And that's the colors you see at the bottom here. And once we, we do that, we can generate synthetic genomes because we can basically sample from these distributions. And here we're using GANs, uh, so neural network-based models, to sample from these distributions for each segment of the genome. And why would we want to create synthetic individuals? Because often there's privacy restrictions or, or other reasons that we can't share DNA, but we need to share uh, training sets in order for algorithms to be trained at different hospitals, et cetera. So synthetic genomes are, are one answer for this. Another reason that it's interesting to label ancestry along the genome is to predict where people came from. And this is another project that I'm working on with, uh, with a group of students, including Helgi and Arvin, um, in which we predict for every segment of the genome, and you're seeing a, a genome growing here out of uh, along the z-axis. As we go along the genome, we're predicting in purple, each purple point, where that piece of the genome came from historically on the globe. And you see the, the map of the world underneath. The ground truth are the, the colors there. So we, we know for this genome where each piece came from. Um, so part, part of it came from Spain, it had a you know, grandparent from Spain and part of it came from Vietnam and part of it from Africa. And we can, we can do this in a more general way. You're looking on the right at a PCA in which we predicted every location of every piece of a genome of a, a, large, a large sample of individuals actually from Stanford Hospital and where every piece of their genome came from ancestrally in PCA space rather than on the globe. And this, this is very useful for making uh, medical predictions. And it's something that, that it's an ongoing project we have if anyone's interested 
I'm happy to talk about it. The other reason that it's fun to predict ancestry along the genome, and this is now just more of a sort of head scratcher, is for historical predictions. So here is a paper that, uh, that uh, published this summer in which we have predictions on the right on the genomes here of uh, individuals from Easter Island. And what you notice, the important point is that they have both Polynesian ancestry in blue, European, which is new colonial ancestry in red, and small pieces of green Native American ancestry. And the question is how did Native American ancestry get to Easter Island and in Polynesia in general? And in this paper, we showed actually that the ancestry got there a long time ago. Basically the Polynesians and Native Americans contacted each other long before the Europeans ever discovered the Americans. And we can show that genetically using these machine learning algorithms. I won't go into the equations in detail, but basically looking at these segment lengths, the lengths of the pieces of DNA from different ancestry, and here you see distributions of those lengths, we can fit uh, using maximum likelihood models to when the populations must have combined, because as time goes by, these lengths of segments get smaller and smaller with recombination, which is what happens when the pieces of DNA are shuffled between the parents when they have a child. And by looking at the lengths, we, we can tell how long ago this occurred. The other thing we can tell is what the connections are between the islands. Here you see a network plot of the European ancestry connections between Polynesian islands on the left and the Native American ancestry connections on the right. And you see those, those networks look very different. That's because on the left, you're seeing a network that reflects the European colonial influence in Polynesia. So you see all, excuse me, French Polynesia connected on the left. Uh, together in one network. And then you see on the right, bottom right, you see the Spanish uh, Easter Island and, and Mangareva connected separately because that's uh, that was colonized by Spain. Uh, but on the, on the uh, bottom on the right, you see the Polynesian connections very different. So we can do all sorts of historical analyses this way, um, which is really, really fascinating thing to do. Um, and we can even reconstruct the whole settlement of Polynesia, which is a paper we have coming out soon. The other thing that I wanted to talk very quickly about is the Stanford, how does this apply to COVID? So here at Stanford, we sampled from nasal swabs from individuals. Everybody's been doing this for the last year. So we know how that works. And we were able to look at the ancestry of these samples. This is work I did with uh, another ICME student, Sharon, very nice uh, work. So here's a PCA, you can see the ancestry. And here's a, we're basically a color plot for every individual who's a different vertical bar of their ancestry fraction in, in different colors. And we see we have a lot of Native American ancestry in light blue. That means we had a lot of Hispanic individuals who are about half Native American ancestry. And that's, mainly because they couldn't shelter in place. And we can see with time how that Native American ancestry here shown in red jumps up. So at first, the ancestry of the COVID patients at Sanford is mostly people who are traveling and, and ca contacting it from people who had traveled. And that's on the left when we first heard it hit in March. But with time, it becomes mostly Hispanic individuals that's shown by the high Native American ancestry in red on the right, who are not able to shelter. Um, and we can do a genetic analyses on these ancestries and see certain hits along the genome where there's traits that are associated with having more severe COVID. And that's shown here, we actually found some interesting hits. And we can also look at the viral genomes and we can cluster them because they mutate with time. And we can look at how those clusters reflect in different populations and severity. And finally, we can look at the microbiome. We can look at every bacteria and virus sequence that you have in your nose at the time the swab was taken. And we can look at the people who have more severe COVID and what sort of distributions of bacteria and viral genomes they have besides COVID. So what other things are making their infection worse? And of course, there's all sorts of things going on. You have all sorts of bacteria and viruses changing in frequency. And actually we can predict with high accuracy your severity of COVID by just looking at the other bacteria and viruses you have in your nose, not even looking at COVID. Um, I just wanted to last highlight Pierre, who was another ICME student who I worked with on, on some of this data, who looked at other factors. Of course, important always to recognize that genetics and viral uh, effects are not the only thing going on. There's a lot of other factors, social factors, age, um, the, 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 um, your BMI, your gender, and, and your sort of economic status that have a large effect on, on how severe COVID was. And this is something we always want to keep in mind uh, when we're thinking about this. So I just acknowledge all the collaborators we had. These are big collaborative projects. A lot of uh, Latin American people uh, who helped collect samples for the Polynesia study and the American, Native American study. And here are the COVID omics, a lot of collaborators at Stanford Hospital who made this data happen and all come together. Thank you, Alex, for that fascinating talk. Um, again, let's save our questions for the uh, panel discussion at the end. And I'm now gonna move to uh, introduce Eric Shockve, who's our final speaker in this session. Um, Eric is the Lester Levy Carter Professor of Chemical Engineering here at Stanford. Uh, he earned his bachelor's from Princeton, um, MS and PhD from Stanford, all in chemical engineering. 
Uh, he was then a postdoc at the uh, DAMP department at Cambridge. Um, and current research interests include um, non-Newtonian fluid mechanics, non-equilibrium polymer statistical dynamics, and suspension mechanics. Uh, he's authored uh, over 200 publications uh, and received a number of impressive awards. Um, I'll just name a few recent highlights, the 2018 Alpha Chi Sigma Award from the AICHE, um, was elected fellow of the APS in 2001, and then was uh, elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2013. Um, Eric, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Allison. So I uh, have been with ICME from the very beginning. I was actually on the committee, you know, when dinosaurs were on the earth uh, that formed ICME. So even though I'm on sabbatical at Chicago, I wouldn't miss this. Um, what I'm going to tell you about is something that's been near and dear to my heart uh, for about the last decade, which is simulation based engineering science. And in short, uh, what you do is you do a computer simulation uh, in this particular case of a microfluidic device and then use that to design the microfluidic device uh, rather than do it in an Edisonian fashion because microfluidic devices cost thousands of dollars uh, each. Um, and this work has just appeared in lab on a chip uh, in 2020. And what I'm gonna talk about is actually design of a, a device to measure the flexibility of human red, red blood cells in your body. Um, now we've been involved in my group with simulations of red blood now for again, more than a decade. Uh, our most advanced code that we've developed within ICME is an immersed finite element method uh, for deformable particle suspensions. We can do thousands of cells uh, if not millions of cells in complex geometries that mimic uh, that of the vascular network, uh, which I you see some pictures of here. Uh, why do we care? Why are we going to apply this big hammer to RBC flexibility? Well, it turns out that the flexibility is a biomarker for a number of diseases, classically sepsis, but most recently it's been uh, demonstrated that it's also a biomarker for COVID-19. Essentially, any, uh, any disease which attacks the membrane of the red blood cell can affect its, uh, affect its flexibility, and therefore blood diseases are particularly, um, essentially, uh, it's particularly important to understand RBC flexibility for understanding blood disease. So when I talk about flexibility, what do I mean? Uh, in the upper left-hand corner are some healthy RBC discocytes. Uh, the membrane, it's essentially a fluid sac, fluid inside, fluid outside, and then a membrane that's on the order of nanometers. The large uh, scale of a red blood cell is eight microns. If you zoom into the membrane, what you have is a spectrum network connected by these band three proteins to a lipid bilayer, and that's the primary resistance to deformation. Uh, so as a result, a red blood cell is essentially area incompressible, uh, it has a tiny uh, small bending modulus and the primary resistance to deformation is the shear modulus in the, that is for deformations in the plane of the membrane. Uh, and we will use the so-called Scalic model, uh, which has been very successful for modeling uh, this membrane in what I'll show you today. So how do people me measure the membrane shear modulus of a red blood cell? Well, this is one example. You take an optical tweezers, you apply, a, a, you put a couple of beads on the membrane, and then you stretch it. You use the scalic model to simulate that deformation, uh, and then you back out a shear modulus for that distribution. And that's great, and it's quantitative, but it essentially is very time and effort intensive. You can do, you know, if you're good, 100 uh, cells, but in fact, uh, that doesn't give you the distribution in your body, which is of interest. So it's quantitative and it's responsible for the measured values of the modulus. But what we want to do is take a person's blood and in, let's say, 20 minutes, determine the entire spectrum of their shear modulus in their body. So how do we do that? We start by doing simulations. And so this is a result. Uh, these are a large, a high fidelity, parallelized immersed boundary simulations of red blood now going through a contraction and into a channel. What you see is they reach what I'll call an umbrella shape. 
that umbrella shape is a function of how confined they are. That is a measure of the size of the cell divided by the gap and something called the capillary number. Uh, and the capillary number is inversely proportional to the shear modulus. So it's a representative of shear deformation to membrane resistance. And for a given capillary number and confinement, you can predict this shape. Um, so what we do is we do simulations of many red blood cells uh, through various channels. We find a measure of their deformation, which we call the Taylor deformation. That's in the lower plot. The upper plot is the area of the cell that's given by that blue line that covers the perimeter. And so we define the confinement uh, in terms of the square root of the area. Uh, and then we measure the Taylor deformation. And what this tells you in the simulation is how far downstream you have to go to a nice umbrella shape that is characteristic of the shear modulus of this red blood cell. And what you find is you got to go 350 to 500 microns downstream. And you do this for many inputs. So you uh, input with many initial conditions and you find out that 300 to 500 microns is fine for measuring both the area and the deformation of these cells. And then you go into the laboratory and you do this. You construct your uh, cell. This is in Juan Santiago's lab in mechanical engineering. And here are the experimental images of that same thing. That is the flow of red blood cells through this contraction. And you see that in the experiments, if you configure it properly, you almost have the same resolution that you have in the simulations. Um, so we do this now with various donors' blood. Here is uh, a healthy donor. We measure with the images, the velocity of the red blood cells, the confinement based on the area, and the Taylor deformation. And this is for almost 1,000 cells. We can do this in 20 minutes. Uh, and so we have a distribution that are near Gaussian of all of these variables. We also put the same person's blood in the refrigerator. You keep it for five weeks and it turns out what happens. It deforms a lot less. It's kind of well known than keeping some blood in the refrigerator changes its shear modulus. So we do uh, these measurements and then we take these measurements and we throw them on our computationally developed solution surface. And because we know that solution surface, that is Taylor deformation confinement as a function of capillary number, and when we've measured uh, all of the dimensional variables, we can back out indeed the shear modulus distribution. So here is the shear modulus distribution for five healthy donors. The mean value is very uh, exactly the same as measured in the literature, but now as you see, we have the full log normal distribution. It takes about 2000 cells to get the right distribution. And if you age it for five weeks in the refrigerator, indeed, we get another log normal distribution, which has a modulus that's about a factor of eight higher. Um, so we do this now with disease patients. I don't have time to show you, but we now have COVID blood, sepsis blood. Um, this is also sensitive to oxygenation. So we control the oxygen concentration. We're using it as a biomarker for disease. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions in the uh, sit down session. Thank you, Eric. Fascinating talk. Um, I think we're gonna move to the panel discussion. So I believe all the speakers are gonna be brought up. Yep. Okay, so I'm not seeing any uh, questions in the chat from the audience so I can start us off, um, but please, please put your questions uh, in the um, in the chat. Um, so um, maybe I'll start with uh, Ellen. Um, so I'm wondering how you talked about using computational modeling to evaluate drug safety, and I'm wondering how that kind of interfaces with traditional methods of evaluating drug safety that are used by pharma companies and how receptive they've been to, um, to the methods that you're presenting. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Um, so I guess the, the current methods just look at either the cell scale or the heart scale, right? So they do test these drugs first in the dish on just a single cell, and then they scale it up to the heart. And our method actually can bridge because we use a multi-scale model. We use information across all scales. 
and we can read out at every um, point in, in every spatial scale and every point in time. So I think that's very unique that you can use computation um, to really bridge scales in the sense of multi-scale modeling. Great, thanks. Um, Alex, I, I was fascinated by you know your what you talked about related to genomic ancestry. And I'm wondering, so obviously that has important implications for understanding historical migrations. Um, I'm wondering also how that information is used in, in clinical decision making. Absolutely. That's a really um, you know, important topic these days, and, and we're talking about it a lot. So there's, there's both the way people self-identify and, and societal influences that have a really important impact on, on medical outcomes. And then there's, of course, their, their genetics and what, what's going on in their DNA, which also has a very important impact. And so um, we, we do use uh, genomic ancestry a lot, and we're increasingly trying to incorporate it because it, it makes a big difference when you're making predictions about risk for, for various diseases based on genetics, what, what someone's ancestry is. In fact, what someone's ancestry is in the specific gene that, that's relevant to that disease. And so that's why these algorithms I talked about that, that we're working on to, to do very accurate predictions are so important. Um, and it's becoming more important because previously studies really focused only on European descent individuals just because it was simpler statistically if we could just control all of the genetic effects. So we we're looking at people who are all basically very similar. But uh, as, as we often say, more than 50% of the babies born in California today are not even from a single ancestry. They're from mixed ancestry. And so it, it, it won't work anymore even just to look only at, at other ancestries, only at Africans and, and models only for Asians. We, we need to have models for mixed, uh, you know, the, the future of, of our societies. So um, it's becoming very important and, and I'm really excited about. Super. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your findings related to the microbiome and the how that impacted the severity of COVID? Sure, we, we found one, uh, one um, bacteria, Shuanella, that's very clearly associated with, with a more severe COVID infection. It's, you know, there, as all of these associations that it's are, it's, it's not clear what's causation and what's correlation, um, but it doesn't really matter if what you're trying to do is, is just make a prediction. And one of the things that I think is really interesting that's come out of all of this uh, COVID work is that I think the future of medicine is going to be much more data-driven. We are going to go to the doctor and we're gonna take a nasal swab and there won't be any more of this, you know, you have a cold maybe, or maybe it's strep, I don't know, take some Tylenols and see how you feel in, in another week. We're, we're gonna take a nasal swab, we're gonna sequence everything that's in there as we are already doing in these studies and as we were doing with COVID and we're gonna know exactly what's going on. Um, and I think, I think that's what's really exciting about data science now and as it's kind of exploding in, in medicine. Super. So we have a question for Ellen from the audience. Um, what is the quality of long-term predictions on the effects of drugs using this approach? And would it be useful to merge detailed simulations and data, perhaps in that context? Yeah, yeah this is... I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. sorry, that was for Ellen. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So thanks. This is a good question, a great question, actually, because um, we've done it now only for this very small time window. I think simulation allows us with the separation of time scales to actually do this long term and look probably at different points along this axis. And then um, I think really having a multi-fidelity approach, we can also, we were also thinking about feeding data into um, a surrogate model, not just using um, input from a one and three dimensional simulation, but also real data so that we can have a, a multi-fidelity um, kind of surrogate model that embraces all kinds of uh, input from different different fidelity, different sources, different scales. And so real data to, to feed into this directly would actually be great. That's a great idea. Super. Um, for Eric, um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the disease applications that you're planning to look at next and um, you know what simulations can inform us about the status of red blood cells and where you know, sort of where things are going in that direction. Right. So we've been looking uh, particularly at three uh, different diseases, chronic fatigue syndrome, sepsis, and uh, COVID-19. Um, turns out that the sensitivity of the red blood cell shear modulus to oxygen concentration is the biggest 
harbinger of those diseases. Uh, why is that? Because your red blood cells actually um, are their own little oxygen sensors. So that connection of, of the band three proteins to the spectra network that I showed you depends on the oxygenation of the cell. So in your brain, the red blood cells themselves actually help control flow. In fact, some people now think that the entire, the control of essentially blood flow in the brain is almost entirely done by the red blood cells themselves. So what we're doing is um, we've redesigned our chip. So now we actually do oxygen rich and oxygen poor. So we have nitrogen channels that go near the, near the um, red blood and we work under deoxygenation conditions and measure the flexibility as a function of oxygen concentration. So that's our next, uh, that's our next big thing. We use the same device, same simulations, except now we control the oxygen concentration and, and we're doing that. Um, uh, we've done that now with uh, sepsis and we're doing it with CFS and we're seeing basically that the blood in these cases is insensitive to oxygen concentration, which isn't a good thing. Regardless of whether the, the mean flexibility is changed, it's not sensitive to oxygen concentration, which essentially means you can get brain fog because you can't increase your local flow rate. Uh, uh, you can't control the flexibility, so you can't oxygenate parts of your brain that are in lower oxygen case. Um, so that's probably the most interesting thing we're doing right now. Great, thanks. Um, all right, I think we need to wrap up the uh, this session there, um, but I'd like to thank all three of our speakers and um, and remind everybody that we're going to be back at uh, 10 a.m. for the Society Centered uh, Session 2. Thanks, everyone. I'll hand it back to the organizers. <laughs>